Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Is that loud enough? Can you hear me back there? Okay. Sometimes I'm not sure <laughs> how far it goes. All right. Let me just share this for a minute. Hallelujah, Jesus. Well, we can go as far as we want to in Christ. We can go as high as we want, deep as we want. We can know the height and width and depth and breadth of the knowledge of Christ. Jesus never sets any limits on himself. The only thing that keeps us from exploring him and exploring ourselves with him is hunger, is desire. Um, when we think that we've arrived and we know it all, that's when we find out we don't know much. <laughs> Can you give Elena a paper pen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, it really is an important time in the world and in the spirit. Because not only do we have God shaking the earth, we also have God shaking the heavens. And he's shaking his people. Amen? So we just want to welcome everybody that's coming online. Let me make sure I have my phone off and on silent here. Hallelujah. I had a message prepared, and today the Lord said, no, I want you to go back and do this one. <laughs> um, and what it is is I transcribed what happened Friday night during worship here, and I posted on my Facebook wall. So all of you that are listening online, you can find my notes online. Um, and the reason why Jesus does that is because so many people are struggling right now. Because there's a lot of pressures and demands put upon us, not only from the world, but from friends, family, enemies, jobs, kids, spouses, everything, life. And we have to learn how to navigate those but still not lose our own inward peace and joy. And part of that is there are cycles of extreme and then there are cycles of peace. And um, we talked about that yesterday on our prayer watch. Um, I haven't typed it out yet, but it's very, very powerful. There are cycles. When we're in the pressure cookers of life and circumstances, and there's no way you're getting out because God put you in there. But then there's times when the Holy Spirit says, okay, you've had enough, you're coming out now, and he brings you out. But whenever you come out of what you went into, you come out changed, you come out different. And during worship, I saw angels with, um, um, the only way I can describe it, what do you call those things? When you have a wood stove or a fireplace and you have like a um, dustpan and you're sweeping the ashes out of the hearth so that you can put more wood in, I saw the angels sweeping out the old ashes out of our spirits, our fireplace, which is your spirit man, because that's where he burns, his presence burns. He, they were sweeping out the last of the old ashes from the last fire and of the old, and they were getting ready for a new load of logs to come in, to be put in with, into his people, into men. And so whenever there's a uh, cycle change or a shift, he will often give us different pictures of what he's doing, of what's ending and what's beginning, so that we understand. And we were worshiping tonight to the breath of heaven. And whenever the breath of heaven comes in, it, whenever breath comes in, something new is entering you. When fresh breath comes, when we're weary, we find that we get a second wind. And all of a sudden, we find a new strength. We find a new faith. We find a new vision. We find new whatever we need because that breath comes, right? That's why I saw in worship. There's a fresh breath coming to those that are weary. There's freshness coming. That is going to revive you. That's going to satisfy you. That's going to cause you to expand and the troubles that you've been in, 
our only preparation for this second wind that's coming in. I just want to read you a prophetic word just for a minute. Yep. It goes along with what Sue just said, the second wind. Yep. This is this prophetic word. It's prophesied to more swallow, but I want you to hear it. The church is like a long-distance runner. He said, we have entered the last mile of the race. The finish line is just ahead. Can you see it? God is bringing all things to a climax. Jesus is coming. We are living in the time known as the climax of the ages. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. The church, like the runner, has slowed down. The spirit of weariness has fallen upon it. Yeah. Christians, evangelists, teachers are tired and slowed down. Yeah. He said, a spirit of weariness has fallen upon it. After many years of fighting Satan's attacks, discouragement has set in. Their enthusiasm and joy are dwindling. Now, if you were here Friday night, this is what Pastor Timmons was saying. Yeah. What showed him that. Yeah. Satan has deceived many thousands into believing that they are in a losing battle. He has convinced others that they deserve a rest. They have been carrying the load long enough. It's time for someone else to pray, to teach, to preach, to witness. But the Spirit of God is saying, now listen to this. Here's what he's saying tonight. Don't give up. The best yet is yet to come. Don't give up. The finish line is just ahead. Don't give up. Within reach of winning the race, you can do it. This is not a time for the church of Jesus Christ to relax, be at ease, slow down, or rest. Just as a runner receives a second wind, hear it, giving him a strong burst of energy to win the race, God is breathing a new, fresh, second wind of his spirit upon the church, which will cause the church to surge forward in a greater demonstration of the power of God than we have ever experienced. The world is going to know without a doubt that there is a miracle working God, that there is power, healing and cleansing in the name of Jesus. Yeah. That was the word of the Lord, the second wind. So that's just one thing in the spirit when we were worshiping. You know, and the angels were removing the ashes of the old. And it doesn't mean the old was bad. It just means that part of your life is finished. You must move on. Or you must move in or you must move through into something that you're about to do. And so um, oftentimes when we, like in times of worship, when we have these encounters, it's a time when we can take a breath and just shut things out. We can close our eyes. We can sing. We can just sit there. And suddenly we'll have encounters or, or thoughts or verses will come to us or feelings will come to us. Why? Because we're focusing in. We're shutting things out around us. And so when we're worshiping, it's a time to not interfere with other people when they're worshiping, but just to dive in ourselves, because there's so much more that he wants us to explore. Did anybody else get anything during worship? I know you did. We all have halos uh, uh, are yeah. yeah. And I know I was dancing with the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes we need that because we need God's love. And Marianne often sees that just about every yeah. every meeting. I saw the 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 fire. 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 Yeah. It's because sometimes that's what we need to see for our life. We see what we need to see. Sometimes God will show us things we don't want to see, but, or we think we're not ready to see, but usually what he reveals to us is what heals us. And God is fulfilling his desire and our desire at the same time. Did anybody else get anything during worship? Did anything hurt you, friend? 
I know you do. <laughs> well, for the past two days, I've been, um, oh, for the past two days, um, I've been um, hearing the word rest, mm -hmm. and I got Hebrews 4, 7. So God set another time for entering his rest, and that time is today. Yep. So. Absolutely correct. You wanna, somebody want to give Amy and Adriana a paper? Okay. Hallelujah. Absolutely accurate. See, in the time of natural and spiritual, oftentimes what's going on is opposite. In the natural, you can have war, but in the spirit, you can have peace. In the natural, you can have stress, but in the spirit, you can have rest. In the natural, you can be tired and worn out and dry, but in the spirit, he can rain and water you and flood you with his love. And we've gotten used to being natural of how to navigate this world and survive, but the Lord said, I want you to navigate my world and thrive. And that's a different learning curve for a lot of believers because we're taught our whole life from the day we're born how to act, when to speak, when not to speak, when to obey, when not to obey, when to do this, when to do that, how to think this way, and all these rules. And then all of a sudden, Jesus in interferes with our life, interrupts our life, comes in and says, now you're going to learn how to live for me. And it's not the way of the world. And then we have to figure out how to be a spirit. Because <laughs> we, we know how to be natural, right? But we don't know how to be a spirit. And we realize God's not natural. He's a spirit. And he dwells in our spirit. So there are spiritual applications and manifestations of his word that happen in the natural and in the spirit. But how do we navigate his rest? What is his rest? How do we navigate the garden that's in our life, in our heart? Jesus came and unlocked a mystery when he came and said, the kingdom of God is within you. They didn't know what he meant. They thought he was coming to physically defeat the Romans, wipe them out, and then set up his kingdom on earth in the natural. He said, you don't understand. My kingdom is supernatural. It's greater than the natural. I created everything. Christ and the Father and the Spirit created everything that is. His kingdom is greater than this natural place called time that God put men when they fell. They were spirit beings, but when they fell, they, their spirit imploded inside, and they were put flesh on them, and they were subject to time, futility, suffering, death. And God created time for men to dwell in until he could redeem them. That's not my notes. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is just saying these things. But the church, we tend to think in the natural. And he said, yes, you can read about me in the natural in my word because it's given to you to instruct you and to help you understand. But he says, I'm going to breathe my breath on the word. The breath is coming in. Revelation is coming in. I am going to unlock my words so that you can explore the depths of my words to understand what each word means, each letter means. That's why studying the Hebrew language and letters oftentimes will unlock meanings to you. But even beyond that, Jesus is the word. He said, I'm the word. He said, even in that, don't limit me by men's understanding because over the generations, I'm going to expand it. And the next generation will get more and more and more. Every generation builds on the revelation of the past. And then they add more and more and more until the fullness comes. And the breath of heaven is blowing. Because he wants his people to be knowing and growing. And he's been showing. It 
And he said, I want to take my people deeper. Don't get caught up in the deep things of this world and of darkness and demonic activity and what all everybody's doing in the tunnels and in the caves and in the center of this and in the dark places of that. And don't go deep into darkness. Go deep into me. My light is greater. I am light. And if you want to know me right, you're going to have to come to me so I can give you sight. I'm going to remove the layers of darkness off your mind, off your heart, off your eyes so you can see me as I am, off your ears so you can hear me as I am. I want you to know me. And so we have been, over the years, Lord, we want to know you more and more and more. You know, this in this world, we hardly know him. We know a degree of him, but there's so much more that he's going to pull the curtains back. Hallelujah, Jesus. So Friday night in the worship, uh, and Pastor Timmons talked on, he was amazed because he had the same encounter in the garden with the Lord as well. But he said, the Lord said to me, my people don't know they have a garden inside them. They read it in the word that they were, that I created Eden for them to walk with me in it. But he said, the kingdom is in you. Heaven is in you. The garden is in you. It's your love life with me. The garden is your walk of intimacy. And you can put as much in that garden as you want. You can put anything you want that is a fruit of the Spirit. Jesus gave us keys of understanding. He said, all the fruit that you develop of my nature, my attributes, my being is fruit. It's fragrance, it's worship, it's plants, and you can put it in your heart. That's why he says, add to yourself kindness, temperance, grace, peace, joy, all these things. These are plantings that you put within you because you're taking his word and you're planting it in your heart, and pretty soon you have a lush garden. Pretty soon you have, start having encounters with the Lord. And this is unique because years ago, I had this garden I used to meet Jesus in. And um, one day I looked around, and it had all kinds of things that I liked, because everything you like is in your garden. Everything that you love is in your garden, because Jesus loves what you love when you're with him. And I looked around, and I said, Lord, I said, I love this garden, but can't there be more? Can't it grow and expand and change? He says, yes. And I said, how do we do that? He says, do you want me to burn it down? And of course I said, yes. <laughs> and he opened his mouth and fire came out and he torched the whole garden. I was in shock. <laughs> but sometimes, like we said Friday night, sometimes you need a fire for things to grow higher and lusher and fuller and expand. That's why sometimes farmers will burn their entire fields so that the next year they get greater yields. And so when it burnt down, I said, now what do I do, Lord? He says, let's replant. He says, you want more of me? He said, there's a whole lot more. I want my people to not be satisfied with just where they are. I don't want to be satisfied in my encounters with him, in my visions, my dreams, the way I walk with him. I don't want to be stuck. I don't want to be satisfied. I want to explore. I want to know him more. And so there's many places that you can go in Christ because his whole kingdom is in you. But he said, my people don't know how to walk with me inwardly. They walk with me outwardly, and they struggle to walk outwardly among the world 
because they're trying to connect it together, but it's not, it's separate. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, but you represent my kingdom and you can release my kingdom into the world. So we're having to adapt to learn how to bring light into darkness, love into hatred, peace into anger, healing into sickness. We're learning how to release the kingdom, the garden that we're developing into other people's lives and situations. And he said, you have to learn to adapt to who I am and let me be who I want to be, even if it's different than what you think. He said, because I'm coming to set a generation free. And in the vision Friday night, those of you that were here already heard this, but a lot of you online, maybe you didn't watch Friday nights, but the Lord spoke to me to add more to this. The first part is a transcript of what was said, and the second part is the scriptures the Lord gave me tonight when he was speaking to me about what he started Friday night. So in the vision Friday night, we're all walking in the garden of the Lord. It was a garden scene, that's what I saw, in the spirit, and angels were everywhere. They always are. Wherever you are, they are. There were so many angels that were singing with us as we were worshiping him in, the, in spirit. We were walking up and down in the garden. And I really want to say this. When people are worshiping, don't go up to them and interfere and disrupt their worship. I don't care who they are, even your husband. <laughs> like, I try not to bother pet. Because you're disrupting the spirit that's communing with them. And it grieves the Holy Spirit. I, I am so hungry. And we have to be so intentional that I'm diving in and I'm not coming out till it ends. You know why? Because I'm hungry. I'm hungry. And we have to want him so much. Our attention is on him. The whole time, nothing is going to distract us. Because guess what? If you move with distraction, you're not going very deep. And you know what we need right now? We need deep. Because the church is struggling. Some days I struggle. Some days I just say to the Lord, I said, yesterday, I'm so tired. I was so physically wore out and tired. I just crashed. And it was just because of all the demands, you know, that we have. But the, when I laid on my bed, the Lord said, draw from me. Have another drink. Take another breath. Draw more. Because you're learning, not just to draw, but you're also learning to pour. Because the more you draw, the more you pour. Teach my people how to get restored. Teach them how to get healed. Teach them how to go higher and deeper and further and wider. And he said, don't teach what others are saying and doing. Teach what I'm saying and doing. He said, mirror me. And so in this, as we were worshiping, we were walking up and down. Suddenly, Friday night, as we we're walking around in the garden in the spirit, all of a sudden, we were walking up and down in him. Because guess what? He is the garden. But sometimes we have to see the external scene to get into the reality of it's him, stepping into him, the internal, that is showing you a picture, but you can step into the picture and be in him. So a lot of times the visions you see in worship is actually deeper places of intimacy he wants you to come in. Don't stay just in the vision. Don't stay in the outer court and inner court. Just step into the vision. Step into him. He's showing you the entrance way into the deeper place. That's why I focus, okay, if I'm seeing a vision or I'm hearing a prophecy or whatever it is, I try to engage it. I write it down, I pray into it, Pat and I discuss it because I want to enter it. I want that to be a part of my life. We have to take his words, what do he say, and eat them. I want to eat those encounters so that they 
get stronger and develop longer inside me because you can only give what you develop. You can only give what you develop inside. Whatever you develop inside when you abide is what you can release. And I'm not satisfied. Every part of Christ that's available for me to know and develop and put in my garden, I'm going to have a big garden. Why? Because someone's needing him around me. And the angels were singing in the worship. And even tonight, during the worship, the angels were sweeping the ashes out of the fireplace with the dustpan and a little broom. Why? Because God's making room for the next batch of logs to come inside you. There's more fire coming, more desire coming. There's more passion coming. There's more breath coming. There's more life coming. There's more healing coming. There's more strength and hope and vision. I don't want to be dry. Pastor Timmons' message and Pastor Mark Robshaw's message in the last two months, totally accurate. The church is dead in her head. She's dry. She's lost some fire. She's lost some desire. She's gotten into the ritual and the rut. I don't like ruts. They frustrate me. I'm, I'm all about adventure, so if I see an adventure, I'm like chomping to go get it. <laughs> we can't be satisfied with where we're at. God's sweeping that old away. You're going to have to open up. There's more for him and you. Now, this is what God said, because I, I transcribed it today. He said, children, it's time to live in me. The Lord said to me one years ago, Sue, it's not enough to survive. I want you to learn to live and thrive right where you're at. And right now we're in survival mode because everything is challenging our, us in this world. You know, war and fighting and bickering and politics and religion and everything else is going on. It's all in upheaval because God said it would. He said, I'm going to shake it all. So that everything that is not rooted in me will fall and I'll sweep away it all. And then what's left, you'll see my people remain and abide and continue on. This is just a cycle. You are to abide and continue on through this cycle of shaking. There's more future to go. He said, Sue, thrive. People used to call me Survival Sue years ago. I had a website and ministry in Minnesota, and I taught all the survival stuff. Did thousand yard uh, jars of canning every summer, taught people to can, taught people to had all the survival gear. I did all that. And then the Lord said, that's enough. Get your mind off surviving and start thriving. Yes, you might need some stuff in the future, but it's more important to thrive in me right now and drive your roots down deep in me and draw from me an in intimacy because I can take you further than your limited supplies can do. And so I had to shift gears. And one thing that Pat spoke to me one year, and he said, Sue, you have a poverty mentality. I said, thanks a lot, Pat. Because <laughs> I grew up poor. I mean, my mom was on welfare. I lived on the street for a little while. My mom was on, on welfare for a little while. We lived in very bad places. And so I learned to survive. But he said, no, you might have had to do that for a season, but that's not your purpose. I want you to learn that I will provide for you. I'm a good father. I want you to trust me, to lean into me. And I said, Lord, teach me how to not have a poverty mindset. He said, okay, it's simple. 
You prosper as your soul prospers. This is not in your notes. It's actually in Holy Spirit's notes, so we're kind of going in and out of his notes. He said, Sue, prosper in your mind, your thought life, your mentality, your attitude. How do you see me? Am I your provider? Yeah, sometimes, but then I struggle again. He goes, are you following me? I'm your guider. How are you doing right now? Well, it was good for a season, but then I hit a bump, and then I sat down, and he goes, yeah, get back up and follow again. Learn. Be disciplined. Train your mind to think my thoughts and not focus on any other thing that will pull your thoughts away from my thoughts. He said, prosper. As you prosper, you will prosper. As your soul prospers, my wind will blow in you, my water will flow in you, and prosperity will grow in you. And you can anchor yourself deeper. Uh, the Lord just quickened something to me, and it really is the Holy Spirit, because what he just quickened to me is exactly what Sue just said read view from Friday night what he said. I want to read this to you as an exact confirmation, but it helps us to understand what the Lord's saying to us tonight through her. Now, this is when Rick Joyner was on the top of the mountain in the third heaven, and he had just eaten of the, and then when it went to the top, it was the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Okay? Now, think about that. And he saw the tree of life, and he, they began to eat the fruit of the tree of life, but then, listen to this. Then he said that he went, he had such an experience in the garden, and he said, I began to see such glorious things, and he said, then I opened my eyes, and he said that the Lord was no longer standing there with him. He said, there was a troop of angels. Then he said, one of the angels said, close your eyes again. And he said, when I did, I beheld the glory again. Then the, listen to this, then the angel explained, now listen to what he explained. What Sue just said, what you see with the eyes of your heart, which is within, okay, is more real than what you see with your physical eyes. The Lord dwells within you. The kingdom is within, right? You have taught this many times, but now you must live it. Live it. Now, what did she just read here? That's what she just read. Yep. She said, we have not just seen... We have to live in him. You hear that? But you've eaten of the tree of life. Now you must live it. Now listen to what. But here it goes on. Now listen, confirming. The angel then began to lead me back to the gate to leave the Garden of Eden. He said, I protested that I did not want to leave. Seemingly surprised, the angel took me by the shoulders and looked me in the eyes. This was when I recognized him. It was the angel wisdom. <laughs> now listen to what he said to her. To Rick, listen, you never have to leave this garden. He assured me, this garden is in your heart. Because the creator himself is within you. You have desired the best part to worship and sit in his presence forever. And it will never be taken from you. But you must take it from here to where it is most needed. I knew he was right. I then looked past him to the tree of life because he was being led to leave. I had a compulsion to grab all the fruit that I could before leaving. Knowing my thoughts, the angel wisdom gently shook me. No, even this fruit of the tree of life gathered in fear would go bad. Yep. This fruit and this tree are within you. Because he is in you, you must believe. Yep. So the Lord said, children, it's time to live in me. It's time to sing in me. It's time to shout in me. It's time to dance in me. It's time to breathe in me. It's time to rest in me. It's time to live your life in me. For this world is not your life. This world is an assignment that you were brought into to be a witness for him, but it's not your true reality. It's where multitudes are stuck in this realm.
But because Christ is in you, you have an eternal spirit now, and you live in eternity, which is in you, in your spirit. And so you're a message to those around you. And sometimes the message that others around you receive is what you're developing in your life. They feel God's peace in you. Or they'll feel God's love in you. Or they'll feel strength. You know, when I get around you, I, I, I'm no longer tired. They don't know what that is. But the Holy Spirit is drawing them into the garden that you are so that he can meet them and give them peace because you're the living epistle others will read. He said, it's try, it's, I am your life and my life is flowing in you unto this world. This is what you have on your notes. But draw your attention unto me in this hour. There's a lot of distractions that are trying to divert you right now. Do not allow it. It takes intentional energy and focus to not get pulled out of the spirit <laughs> because people will bother you. People will interrupt you. They'll try to get their word in and try to tell you things when they're not obeying, they're not listening to the spirit. But in your spirit, you can still be feasting with God even though you're listening to men. Amen. You have to learn how to develop both worlds both realms inside you and the one around you. Now listen, it says, draw your attention to me in this hour for my glory is coming in greater power for you are touching my heart this night. There are times in corporate bodies where we actually press in enough to we actually touch his heart and, and Jesus gets excited because we actually burst through a, a layer we've been stuck in, or maybe we just haven't pushed in enough together corporately to apprehend something new, like fresh wind, fresh breath, fresh fire, fresh rain, fresh glory. There's always more available. You're tapping into the realms that you have been... My typo, hang on. You were tapping into the realms that to you have been like night. They've been hard to see at night. You can't see well. You can't always distinguish what's around you because everything's dark. Because you just haven't moved into it yet. I like to take risks. And sometimes um, that's not a good thing. <laughs> but I like to push in a little further. Lord, I'm hungry. He'll say, well, come on then. I want to know more. He says, well, come on then. And sometimes your mind will say, no, no, no. You got to understand it first. You got to study this out first. You got to know before you let go. And the Lord says, let go. And I'll show. Why? Because I'm the flow. I'm the word. I'm the spirit. Trust me. When he's drawing you deeper, trust him. It's not enough to know before you go. You're going to have to move by faith. As we step into the dark areas of his presence that we have not yet tapped into yet, he says it's going to be bright. You just are, I'm removing layers off your sight because you haven't been this way before. Why do you think Joshua had such a hard time getting people to cross over? They were secure in the world they knew. They didn't want to go where they've never been before. They didn't want to deal with opposition or war and warfare in the spirit. They thought, well, they're too big for us. Well, why were they measuring by what they thought? To God, it was a blip on it was a blip and a dot. That's no problem. But it's a mountain to us, so what? Speak to it, it'll fall. But we get blocked when we think that. What we don't know is bigger than who we are. And your spirit man is actually bigger than mountains. In the spirit, you'd be surprised how big your spirit is. He said, let go of the things that will distract you in this hour. This is going to be an important fact for you in this decade ahead. 
you're going to have to shut out distractions intentionally because everything around you is going to try to drown you, to rob you. As soon as the God's word comes, the enemy comes to kill, steal, destroy, or to employ you for the other side. You are the remnant bride. You are the one made for Christ. You are the one being conformed into his image and likeness and sight. Everything in darkness is trying to steal that. And you have to be more determined and diligent to expand your spirit man and your relationship with him. And then, Lord, how do I process that and release it wherever I go in the world? How do I be the extension of your body? that are stuck in the darkness. So he said, number one, get rid of distractions. Number two, come to me and live in me and walk with me in intimacy. But I'm so busy, God. There's so many things I got to do. I got so much on my plate. He says, well, then throw it off your plate. Sometimes we have to get rid of stuff before we can take in more. Sometimes we have to get rid of earthly knowledge and, and for a season and say, Lord, you're the word, teach me. I want to know you. Breathe on your word to me. I want it fresh like dew. And pretty soon the dew comes and it begins to distill in your, in your mind, in your thoughts, in your spirit, and then it begins to condense like rain. You know, there's no rain without dew. God watered the earth in the beginning with dew. And then it pulled into rain. And then it became floods. That's how it starts inside of you as well. It says, walk with me in the garden. Well, the garden doesn't have to be a place of creeks and plants and paths and a little bench and a place where you hear birds singing and all that. The garden can be anything you make of it. There are beaches in heaven that I go to. Sometimes my garden is the beach. Sometimes it's a hillside. It's a pasture full of sheep. Sometimes I'm in the king's stables and I'm taking care of his horses. Sometimes I'm over here on the mountain. Sometimes I'm over here. He said, I'm the garden. And wherever I am, you are. And wherever you are, I am. Get used to me blowing on your garden. He says, walk with me in the garden. Walk with me and know that I am. For you are in the center of my hand and the center of my plan. And I want you to understand. For the longest time, I struggled with figuring out God's plan for my life. What's my purpose? What's my plan? What's my gift? What's my office? What's this? What's that? And I could not figure out where I fit. No matter what people told me, it didn't feel right. I had it wrong. He said, you're in my hand. Number one, I created you, Sue. I'm developing you. I'm growing you. And wherever I expand you is where I'm putting you. Trust me. With you. And pretty soon, I began to find a fit here. And I stayed there for a while. And then pretty soon he said, time to go. Pretty soon I found a fit over here. And I stayed for a while and I grew and I got more confident. And he says, time to go. You're moving again. And then he brought me to the third place. And he says, this is where I've developed you, all your different places you tried to root. He says, now you're going to root and bear fruit. Now you're going to begin to grow and flow. Because you already know, you've just been waiting for me to show. He said, you're in the center of my hand. And in the center of my hand, you'll find my plan. In the center of my plan, you will understand. Hand, plan, understand. Stay in my rest. 
Everybody's running around accomplishing that, growing that, developing that, having big followings, big ministries, all this stuff. I'm not saying that's it. I'm just saying that's just some things. I'm just saying I never wanted any of that. <laughs> Even from the beginning, I just wanted him. But yet he offered all that. And I said, Lord, I don't want any of that. I want you. And he led me at the beginning of my life down this hallway with many doors. I've shared this before. It's, if you do a search, you can find it on my blog. But each door had different ministry opportunities or different life situations, and they were all successful and, and big and powerful and prosperous. And I looked into each one, and, but I didn't feel it. That's the only way I can describe it. And so I would go to the next one, the next one. I got to the end of the hallway, and I was really sad because I thought I missed it. And I said, Lord, I couldn't find any place for me. What's wrong with me? <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's like a realm opened up at the end of the hallway where there was no door. Because who's the door? Christ. All of a sudden, I saw a cave. Well, to me, it was a cave, but it was actually a chamber of the Father's heart. And there was a little chair and a little desk and paper and a pen. And I went in, and I heard the Father's heart beating. I said, that's my place. And my ministry has always developed over time to always write what I hear and write what I see and write whatever his heart is telling me. But then there came a time, and he says, you know the other doors? <laughs> that I showed you, he said, you weren't ready yet, but now I'm going to open those doors. He said, you chose the best course for you because you knew that I was the root so that you of the fruit. And many try to oh, go through the other doors without ever developing me first. And he said, I want my people to want me more than doors and floors and, and things. And I'm not saying they're bad, but for me, that was my choice. And he said, I'm the door tomorrow. I'm not saying, because I've done a lot of things, Pat and I have a lot of water under our bridge. We've been almost 40 years in ministry, 30 years. We've had a lot of supernatural things, but it still comes back to the garden within. Christ in you, the hope and the flow of his glory, right? Stay in my rest. If you don't know what to do in any test or season of hardship, that's the place. You root yourself deeply and you drink of the fountain that's flowing in you because what? The trees on either side of the river bore fruit in every month, a different fruit. In every season, their leaves didn't wither. Their fruit never fell from the tree. They flourished no matter what happened in the world. The trees flourished and developed the fruit they were assigned. That's the way the body of Christ is meant to be. We are the tree to others. We release his fragrance. We release his love, his peace, his joy, his kindness. His grace, patience, be patient. Patience is hard for prophets because <laughs> we're very sensitive um, to activity. But you know, the more kind we are to others, the more fruit we'll bear. And so it says here, can you hear my angels singing over your life? In the garden, the angels were singing Friday night. They were singing over you. You know, angels are assigned to you when you're born, actually when you're conceived. <laughs> They're assigned to you. And others' angels go, come and go, depending on your assignment. You don't just have one, you have many. The angels were singing over you, why? Because your scroll is expanding and you have to hear the fresh song of the Lord coming through the trees, singing over you. 
And when you get still and you get quiet and your mind gets quiet, you ever tried to quiet your mind? <laughs> when you learn to be still and just breathe, pretty soon you can hear his breath coming in the garden. Pretty soon you feel your leaves beginning to flutter. Pretty soon you hear the angels singing because they're releasing inspiration to you. They're releasing faith to you, courage to you, whatever you need. The angels are ministering spirits sent to minister to you in that very moment. They're called to minister to you and strengthen you and sometimes correct you and rebuke you. Can you hear them calling you? Most of the communication in the spirit is by thoughts because it's spirit to spirit. But there are times I hear it audibly. I'll hear different ways. The Lord says, can you hear them? Sometimes your natural ears can't hear, but you can sense their thoughts coming to you. Don't be sad, Sue. Be strong. Don't be afraid. Have courage. Thoughts of hope. Thoughts of faith will come into you. That's the angel speaking to you. It's going to be okay. You're not going to die yet. There's more time ahead. You're going to be okay. So he said, come now, come, and see the things that I have made for you and me. Come. So the Holy Spirit's been calling the church to come out of the world for a season for a rest. So much of the church is stressed. Stressed. How many have been dealing with stress? Well, you're rare. But how many have been dealing with stress? Raise your hands. Come on. There's so much we have to deal with. And the enemy will come. And the Lord will say, don't be stressed. Trust me. Trust me in this. Don't be depressed. Don't be worried. Don't be scared. You're in my hand. Nothing's going to happen to you when you're in my hand. And that's a big issue with a lot of people because they say, well, I believe in God, but they can't trust him fully with themselves. They still try to survive and thrive in, in a circumstance. And he says, surrender to me in this. Can you just surrender yourself into my hand? Can you trust me? I'm not going to. I'm not going to cause you to crash. I'm actually wanting you to unlock. And so learning to trust God in the midst of a situation causes your garden to open up and the breath to come in. And pretty soon you get a second wind. Just like Pat was talking about earlier. Second winds come when we finally give up struggling. When we get to the end of the end of our rope, suddenly when we get to the end of the end of our faith, we find another faith, the faith of God. And suddenly, we get a booster shot, and we break through into a different atmosphere that was always there. But for whatever reason in that struggle, we got kind of stuck. And he says, Sue, trust me. I'm going to work this out the way it needs to. There are things that happen in our life that had it not happened any other way, we wouldn't be who we are today. You know, in my life, I made a lot of mistakes. Obviously, we all have. I made a lot of big mistakes. It cost me decades of my life, and I suffered a lot. I won't go into it, but it was my choices. But God saved me and set me free. I had a very hard life, a hard struggle. I had parents that loved me, but I rebelled. I was highly opinion. You couldn't tell me nothing when I was a teenager. I knew everything. You know how that goes. Then we crash and burn and we learn and we, had, we know nothing. But I said to the Lord one day, I said, you know, I understand now. And this is my point. I said, had I had an easier life, I wouldn't be who I am today. Even though you knew the choices I would make because... He gives us a free will. 
He knows what's written on our scroll. He knows every mistake we're going to make, but he also knows the choices we can make. And when we yield to him, we can make a right choice and avoid some crashes. But even in that, I said, Lord, if I would have had an easier life, I don't think I would be as strong as I am today. I understood the value of the journey. And so don't make the mistake of belittling yourself for your struggles. Actually, struggles develop muscle and makes you stronger. And so he said, but right now, in the struggle, I want you to learn to be still, to just breathe. Shut things out, focus, breathe. And suddenly, you're going to find yourself somewhere else than me. And suddenly, you're going to feel my presence Suddenly, all the struggles you have, all of a sudden, you're going to feel my breath blowing in you. Suddenly, you're not hurting anymore. Suddenly, you're not in physical pain anymore. Suddenly, you're not overwhelmed anymore or tired. Suddenly, you're refired, and you're like, come out of the bedroom. Okay, Pat, let's go. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, I'm ready now. <laughs> you have to get refueled. But we have to learn to stay in continual refueling. So I said all that to say, in the worship, Mike came up and he said today, when he was in it earlier before worship, he was praying. He prayer walks a lot. And he saw the angel of the Lord in the garden at the time of Adam and Eve. He didn't know what it meant. But he was sent here. And when I spoke the very message of what his prayer walk showed him, God was giving him an invitation to come into his garden to get a transformation, to get his needs met so he would be satisfied in his mind and heart. There's an invitation being given to every one of us. There's fresh breath, fresh strength, fresh vision, fresh blueprints and plans. You guys are about to move again. You can't stay in one place too long. You go and you're planted, you get what you need, and God moves you to the next place. You ever got fuel in only one place and never ever in another place in your whole life? What happens if they put water in that fuel? Or sugar or whatever else they do to fuel? Pretty soon your car gets, starts getting bogged up, right? And you have to flush the engine. Nothing wrong with living by a gas station. I'm just using that analogy. God will put us where we, are, where we need him to expand more. Now, at the bottom I said, we are learning to walk in deeper levels of intimacy with the Lord in the garden of our spirit man, which is our hearts. We have entered a season of rest during a time of global stress. Hear me, the natural sometimes will mirror the spiritual. But whenever men are at war, guess what we are at? Peace and rest in him. God is always moving way ahead of the natural realm. And when the world is in anxiety and anger and rage and all this stuff, you're over here in the kingdom and eternity getting what they need. You come back and start ministering to those to bring them out of the cycle they're stuck in. You're the answer for a lot of problems for people. Don't get stuck in the cycles of this world and men. Stay in the cycles of him. He said, get your focus on me. Tap into me. Why? Not only will I set you free, but I will keep you. It's an invitation. I said, Mike, that's an invitation for you. Because he struggles. He has depression and, and, and things in his life. But he's learning to yield. He's learning to ask the Holy Spirit to come in and refresh him and help him. That's how we all grow. So then the Lord said, the garden within our hearts is supposed to water your life. 
as you learn to walk in it. Jesus said to the woman at the well, the Samaritan, I have a river, a stream. I am the living waters. And basically, if you let me into your life, you'll never hunger and thirst and struggle and not understand who I am, but I will water you continuously. Well, give me that water. This is better than the natural. She didn't understand, but you know, the church needs to begin to be sustained by him. In him, we live and move and have our being. He said, you don't have to struggle. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to worry. Trust me. I am working things out because you're in my hand and my plan, and it's time to understand. So he gave me Luke 17, verse 20. It says, when he was asked, when Jesus was asked by the Pharisees, when did the kingdom of God would come, he said to them, the kingdom of God does not come with natural signs to be observed or with visible display in the way they were wanting to recognize. Because guess what? Number one, you can't recognize him in your flesh. He is a spirit. They knew the word inside out, backwards and forwards from childhood. But they didn't understand the spirit of the word. They didn't have revelation. But he was trying to give it to them. He said, you're relying too much on your knowledge, but you're not understanding who I am. Sometimes, even in the body of Christ, we can get so um, debating the word so much we can dissect it down to wood. We kill the spirit in it. He says, how about let me breathe on it and reveal it to you and then release it and then chew on it and then ponder it and then gestate it and grow it and birth it, just like Mary did. Mary pondered. That's why I write things down and I pray into it and study it. Lord, develop that in my garden, inside me. Develop it. I want to be like you. So he said, people will say, look, here it is. See, there it is. Look, let's follow that one. Let's get this one. And it's over here, and it's being built there. And he says, well, stop. He says, here I am. Where am I? I'm in you. Everybody has a piece out there, but I'm the plant. The kingdom is in you. And all of you are going to put the pieces together, but don't depend on one person. Depend on me. And then grow together. The kingdom of God is within you, in your heart, and among you, surrounding you. Why do you think the enemy is challenging the church to not gather anymore, to not fellowship as churches anymore, but to stay at home and fellowship online? Why do you think the enemy causes the church to not come to prayer meetings and corporate gatherings anymore so that we, draw, we die on the vine and we don't become the corporate garden that's supposed to shift atmospheres. When you don't get the nurturing of the whole body of Christ in your physical life, where you are, you get weak. You get stressed. You get challenged because you don't have the relationship that you were meant to have to nurture you. God created the church to be a living body, living stones that vibrate together. Long-distance relationships eventually dry up. I'm not saying that I can't get things online. I like to watch things too. But I need the body of Christ as much as everybody else does. And right now the enemy is trying to divide us but God's trying to abide us. Anytime the enemy brings separation in the world, I don't care if it's in politics, education, whatever. It's because something is bonding. And he has to come and dismantle it and get everybody fighting and disagreeing and whatever else. Because if two can walk together, what can they do? How much power do they have? So when we're all broken apart, that's when everything, what, evil and wicked starts. It's time to come together and realize you were made to be interdependent. 
The body of Christ was made to be interdependent, not independent. Christ is a head that sits on all of us, right? Now, he said, Christ, I am become the way, the garden within you, and you have to learn to walk with me there. Like he told Rick in his book, that's easier said than done. Because there's so many opportunities for natural fast food in the earth. They want it the quick and easy way. Just give it to me. I'm not talking about McDonald's. I'm talking about there's so much being dished out right now that we don't have to pay the price to get. We can just drive up, get it, and we never developed it. We never get the nutrients out of it. We didn't plant it. It's, it's here. Yeah, yeah. It's not here. Yes, yes. Some of us have very weedy, needy gardens. He says everything that we draw from him that we need in this life. Right now, I'm so determined, Lord, no matter how much I want to store up, because I see it's going to get rough in the natural, I know that I'm not going to die until my time. Because even if what I have stored up is only a little, you'll multiply it because my garden is full of you. And that's where my supply comes. We're going to look at that. You're going to be amazed. Your supply comes from inside you and will manifest outside you. Now let's look at this. The Lord said, here's a type and shadow of the garden. In the Old Testament, it said Deuteronomy 2, 7. It said, the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hand. He knows you're walking through this wilderness. He was talking to the Israel because they've been going through the wilderness for 40 years. They had no needs. They didn't have to go shopping for shoes or clothes. They didn't have to take a bath. They didn't have deodorant. They didn't have soap. <laughs> Hallelujah. Think about this, a life with no struggle. Everybody says, I want that. I said, I don't want that. I need the struggle to grow. But God did this as a sign to them. Listen. He said, these 40 years the Lord your God has been with you. You lack nothing. He was a sign. But the problem was they complained the whole time. Even though they had everything they needed, they didn't have to fight. They didn't have to shop. They didn't have to cook. They didn't have to do nothing but just follow. But he said, they didn't want me. They wanted bondage. Even though I showed them who I was, even though the garden flowed in them, they wanted to go back. They all died, but just a few. A whole generation said no to the garden of who the Father was revealing. He was the rock which is Christ, that living, talking rock in the Amplified, Acts 7. I followed you everywhere you were. Where do you think that rock is? It's inside your garden. He's the fountain. But they didn't want it. Yeah, I want to go up and get fast food, and, and um, I don't have to cook. That's nice. The nutrients come from him who is within. Your nutrients that your spirit needs. You know, your body can be healthy, but if your spirit dies, your body will die. You'll get diseases. But when your spirit man is healthy, your mind and your body actually start healing. For 40 years I was with you, you lacked nothing. But all you did was complain and tell me how you want it, when you want it. I don't want manna. I don't want, I want meat. I don't want them. And then they got the meat and it, they died choking on it. And he said, anytime you're out of the spirit and walking in the flesh, you will complain about every blessing I have given you. He said, be careful. Don't wander in the wilderness. Stay in my garden. Learn to eat from my garden. If you need manna, 
My angels will bring a loaf of bread to your front door or a jar of peanut butter or whatever you like. You'll find it. They'll even have a potato truck break down in front of your front house and need help, and the guy will give you a couple of sacks of potatoes for helping him. God has many ways. He'll multiply what you have. Your jar of oil and wheat or flour or gluten-free, whatever you like, Heaven's flowers better anyways. Will not run out until it's time to run out. The church needs to be spell, still to have some peace. Trust God. He has more than you need. He'll provide. It's an invitation to a fuller spiritual life. Now he says Galatians 5.16 is on your paper. But he says, what do we do? Walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit. You don't have to pray out, out loud in tongues wherever you go. Your spirit prays. Your spirit communes with him who's inside, and you're talking back and forth together internally while you're doing things externally. You live in both realms. Develop both worlds. You live, eternity is in you, moving, but you're serving. In the natural world, don't feel hindered. Your spirit prays all the time. Develop your spirit man. Your spiritual life will manifest in the natural. Walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit, which means be responsive to him, controlled by him, guided by the Spirit. I depend on the Holy Spirit. All throughout my day, Lord, I need you. I draw from your grace in this moment. I draw from your grace. You have a grace for everything, and in this moment, I draw from your grace. For my pace of my race, I draw from your face, God. I learn to draw. The kingdom within you is more real than the natural realm. He says, when you learn to live habitually in the spirit, it says then, there's a semicolon there, this is the effect. Then you will, not, you will certainly not gratify the cravings and desires of your flesh, your natural man, your human nature without God. Do you know that our spirit man can love God with all our heart and mind and soul and spiritual strength, but your body? will be mean. Your body wants stuff and wants its way and dominates and controls. You have to bring your flesh under the control of the Holy Spirit. You have to bring your opinions under the control of the Holy Spirit. You can't dominate somebody because what you're doing to them, you're doing to the Lord. And how we treat each other is how we're treating the Lord in that moment. He says, be full of and controlled by the Holy Spirit. In your spirit, in your soul. And your soul is like all over the place. And when you're trying to go to sleep, your mind is like, yakety, 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 yak. And you have to drag it back and tell it to shut up. Be still. <laughs> Bring it under subjection of the Holy Spirit because it wants to have its say. How many, have, how many know what I mean? And your flesh. I don't want to go to bed. It's early. Shut up and enter his rest. Be still. Your spirit man might be strong, but you have to develop your soul and your flesh and bring it under the control of the Holy Spirit. Because when you do, you won't be mean to somebody else or controlling or dominant, you'll actually have respect, and you'll actually let others be who they're supposed to be. It won't be about you anymore. It'll be about them. And Pat tells me that all the time. We have discussions on this. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will tell me, shut your mouth. Don't say anything. It's not about you, Sue. It's not about what you think about this. It's about, let me tell you what I think about this. And then when I listen, I go, wow, that's really good, Lord. But 
sometimes in the body of Christ, we're headstrong and, and opinionated and dominant and aggressive. I can be aggressive, because as prophets, we mostly are. And usually God will put a dominant and a, aggressive and a passive person together. Pat and I are both aggressives. <laughs> and But sometimes the aggressive personality wants to dominate the passive one. And we need to respect the passive person and be subject to them as well because Christ is in them. And when you disrespect them by putting yourself first before them, you actually shut the Lord down in your life. And then you get stuck where you are. And one day I said, Lord, why am I stuck? Because you disrespected Pat. You didn't listen to him. You wanted to have your say. But he had an answer for you that day. And I had to go apologize. I'm just using this as an example. How do we get stuck in our gardens? How do we not grow anymore, right? He said, learn to yield and trust my spirit, because I'm working in everybody, and let them grow. Don't control how they grow. They're not like you. Pat and I are compatible, but we're not like each other in a lot of ways. We're going the same way, but we trigger off each other because he knows more, and I flow. <laughs> he is the encyclopedia, and I kind of get stuff, and he tells, you know, we all, we comp we're we compatible, and we fill each other. We fit each other. But God speaks to him different than me. And you can't think that someone's less than you or more than you. You have to let them be them because you actually hinder yourself from growing when you try to control their growth. They have to be them. You have to be you. And when you can enjoy each other the way they are and let them express God the way they're meant to, guess what? You're going to get a river that's going to bust out of your lives. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be powerful. He said, I'm going to burn up the flesh of my people and the soul, and I'm going to shut you down. And you're not going to be able to do anything for a season because I'm building somebody else up, and they're going to come forth because you've been hindering them. I said, Lord, I don't want to hinder anybody. He said, then stop trying to control them so that you feel your needs are met. What about their needs? When's the last time you met somebody else's needs and didn't want anything for yourself a whole day? Can you ever go a whole day without having your say? So I've had to learn to be quiet. I've had to learn to shut up. And I've had to learn to be corrected. How do you think the body of Christ is ever going to learn to fit next and connect to each other if we don't what? Respect each other, right? This is the Holy Spirit. I mean, I'm, he's just saying this. This is how we develop a relationship, right? Romans 8, verse 4 says, So the righteous and just requirement of the law might be fully met in us who live and move, not in the way of the flesh or soul power, but in the ways of the spirit. He says, you can't even meet my words, expectations in your life. This is Sue's translation of that. Unless you live and move and have your being, being in me. You know my word, but you don't know me. You might know me, but you've never let me change you. He said, you can't even meet. You can't even let my word flow in you because you are steering it. You're controlling the flow. And he said... Let my spirit flow. Let me flow you. It is actually going to be fun, Sue. And he said, your lives are governed not by the standards according to the dictates of the flesh, but are controlled by the spirit. My biggest desire in my working on myself is, Lord, every thought I bring under your control in this moment, every 
word I want to say. I have to be careful that I say, Lord, is this thought from you before I say it. I don't want to be sorry that I spoke something that was mean or selfish or whatever or opinionated. He said, Lord, I bring every word under your control, every thought, every action. I want to be full of and controlled by you. I want you to be you through me. And that's a daily, intimate, yielding, moment by moment, breath by breath. That's called growing up, right? Verse 5, for those who are according to the flesh and are according to the spirit, oh wait, those who are according to the flesh are controlled by its unholy desires, will set their minds on and pursue the things that gratify the flesh. Now the Lord said to me, unholy is not just sinful. He said, anything you do that you want to do apart from me can be wrong for you because you're driven, because you love those things. And he said, they can be an idol to you. They can be just a work to you that will drain you of life. I'm tired of doing things that drain me, right? He said, the things that you do in your flesh are controlled by your desires that you set your mind on, and you will pursue those things that you love in your flesh. Nothing wrong with enjoying some flesh, some of this natural life, but he said, make sure who's in control of that. Submit the control to me, right? Now, it says here, but those who are according to its, the spirit are controlled by the desires of the spirit will set their minds on that and will seek those things which gratify the Holy Spirit. Do you know the Holy Spirit likes camping? He likes hiking. He likes boating. He likes shopping. He likes water parks. He likes dog parks. He likes everything. He loves to enjoy your life with you. But sometimes we don't realize how much he enjoys you, being with you spending time with you in what you like to do. It's a partnership. He said your spirit is beginning to flow in everything because he said you're including me in it. He said the mind of the flesh, verse 6, is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit. He said, in other words, you will try to reason things out sometimes and dissect them and analyze them, even in a religious mindset or an education mindset or a scientific mindset or whatever mindset we are in, because I'm not, I'm not scientific at all, but I like science stuff, and I was never good at math beyond... Um, I never understood algebra, so anything from there on, forget it. It was like over my head. But anything that I can receive and I can believe, he said, you, will, you can conceive it. And suddenly what you can't understand or learn or know, I can teach you. I can expand your learning. You make room for me, and all of a sudden, you understand algebra. Sunday, suddenly, you'll understand chemistry. Thank God I didn't take that either. Suddenly, you'll understand biology. When I was in high school, it was I didn't have to do those, so I kind of avoided those. But you know, all of a sudden, when you're in the spirit, all of a sudden, things make sense in, in creation, in biology. All of a sudden, you start understanding how creation works. All of a sudden, you get past your analyzing mind into his mind. And he teaches you and expands you where you couldn't go. The mind of the flesh, which is sense and reason, without the Holy Spirit, is death. It will kill you. It will drain you, suck you dry. So you wore out and you just want to shut yourself away from everybody because everybody just irritates you. Go away. <laughs> you know, we can get mean at times. He said, death comprises of all the miseries arising from sin both here and hereafter. He said, Sue, how you operate here is just not natural. 
It's spiritual because who you are inside affects the natural, and what you are in the natural affects your spirit life. As you are now, you're also there in heaven. What you're doing now on the earth, if you died today, you'd be doing that in heaven. You live in both worlds. He said, the mind of the spirit is life and soul peace. Your peace is not determined by people around you or circumstances or pressures or global events. Your soul peace is determined by Christ, who is your peace, who is you are developing in your thought life. He is your peace. He is the river flowing through your soul, your mind, your body. I lay there at night and I practice, Lord, I draw from my spirit man, the river and fountain that's flowing within. I draw it up into my soul right now, into my mind, my will, my emotions, my being, my memories, my past. And I draw that flow so you can begin to move things where they need to go. And then I draw it into my body as I'm laying there, to make it whole and to renew me and transform me. You are a river of life. In your daily life, you get debris. You know, we live in a muddy, dirty world. But every day you take a bath, right? In the natural, take a bath in the spirit. Flush. I don't care if you have to do it a thousand times. Sometimes I do it lots of times. But I'm learning to draw on him more. That's why we're changing. That's why the glory is increasing. That's why his, the canopy is, is growing. That's why the garden is beginning to manifest. Because we are progressing deeper into him. Now, He said, the fruits of our shared love. He gave me a revelation on this. This is why I wrote it this way. He said, the fruits and the plants in your garden, Sue, do you know what they are? Do you know what you're growing? Do you know how it grows? How you plant? And I said, no. He said, read Song of Solomon 5, verse 1 through whatever I did here in the Amplified. It says, I have come into the garden, into your garden, Sue. You're my sister, my promised bride, right? We're the bride of Christ, right? I'm gathering my myrrh with my balsam and spice. From your sweet words, I gather the richest perfumes and spices. Do you know our words to him? Our prayers, our thoughts, our words become spices, perfumes, sweetness to him. And he gathers it, and he plants it inside of us because it bears fruit in our life, right? I eat the honeycomb with my honey. You know, the honey is his love. It's healing. You have honey in your garden, and he comes to partake of you, to eat up the honey you're developing. I drink my wine with my milk. I come to eat and feast and dine with you. Feast on, O revelers of the palace. What did Jesus say? When you ask the Father and the Spirit and I to come in, we will come in and sup with you and feast and dine. We'll eat bread and wine, right? He comes in to feast with us and us to him, right? It's an intimate fellowship. Drink abundantly of love, O oh precious one. We all need more love, but we also need to show more love to others. Don't be mean. Don't be controlling and dominate. The greatest love you can show a person is to let them be themselves and not try to control them. You can try to give them your faith. They're different from you for a reason. We all have a different, we're all a different stone, but we connect together. We all have a, par, a part to play. 
Drink abundantly of my love. This world needs love. This generation needs love like nothing. We are loveless. They're looking for love in all the wrong places, even the church. The God of love is returning. He's going to open up the love in this turtle dove and awaken love like never before. He said, drink abundantly of love, O precious one, for now I know you are mine, irrevocably mine. You know what you love you won't give yourself fully to? That's true. If you don't fully love something, you won't open up to it. You will withhold a portion of yourself because you can't trust it, right? I've been married before, and I can tell you guys this. I made wrong choices. <laughs> I married um, very worldly, abusive uh, men and paid a price. And so did my children. But when I met Pat, when I was married to those men, I could not be, I tried to love them, but I couldn't open my spirit to them because there was things wrong. I tried. But when I met Pat, for six and a half years, we knew each other by the spirit. Actually, when I met him, we were the same. I mean, we weren't one, but we were the same. We were going the same way. We were triggered by the same things. We were just like, whoo, you know, and God just kind of blew us the same direction. But we knew how to be a spirit and respect the spirit in each other before we ever became one in the flesh. You know, there's a lot of couples that became one in the flesh, but they just cannot get past their soul and their spirit. They can't open up. They can't communicate. So they control and denominate, or what did I say? Dominate, sorry, not denominate. <laughs> <laughs> we have to learn to be one in the spirit before we can be one in the natural. And I think the church has lost the spiritual part. We, we try to get connect physically in the natural, but we all we do is get hurt. We blame each other. We get offended. We get irritated. We don't like that. It's not the way I want. You got to do what I want. No. And then we leave and we backbite and everything else. He said, try learning to be spirits together, growing together in the spirit, one with me. And then you won't abandon each other so much. You will recognize me and each other, and you'll learn to love one another and lay your life down for one another. I have no problem with Pat being first. I have no problem with Pat being the one that's up here. Actually, I kind of like being on the front row for a team because I've learned to let go of who he is and who he's supposed to be and just be me. Sometimes we try to conform everyone around us to be secure. You can never do that. Your security comes from Christ. Your unity is not just agreeing in the natural at a soul level or physical level. But it says the Holy Spirit will knit us together in our heart and in our mind. And then we learn to agree together in our physical walks as we grow, right? He says, drink of my love. And Bob Jones' last message was to our time. The fathers that have gone, they said, have you learned to love? We can tell Jesus how much we love him all day long, but he says, but you don't love them. And then the bigger thing was, he said to me one day, you don't love yourself. And I went, ouch. You can't love someone else if you can't love yourself. And it's not loving the flaws in your life, loving him in your life who's at work in your life and letting him change you and just loving you where you are. Love yourself where you are and give yourself a break and let love change you. Give God the reins of your life. He will fill your needs. He will so satisfy that the very one you argued with 10 minutes ago 
all of a sudden you see him on the couch and you go jump right next to him and say, hi, honey. And he'll go, you were just mad at me. I said, yeah, but I love you now. <laughs> I don't do that, but I'm just saying, God can change our heart. I do like to jump over and couch and say hi. But you know, we grow moment from moment. And if you fail and mess up, say, I'm sorry. I love you. I'm learning. Help me. And then give me another chance. And then change. Make an effort to be a spirit. Make an effort to be different, but yet receive each other in your differences. Because if you keep dominating the person that you love, they're going to die on the vine. They're going to dry up. They're going to disconnect to survive because you're trying to drive. I've had to do that. The Lord said, let them go. Let them grow. They're not like you, but they're going to make you happy if you can receive them the way they are. I've had to do that with many people in my life. And I learned to love. Because if I can't receive God's love in my spirit, I can't release it. And the river and the glory and the miracles and the power we're all seeking is what? In you. But it can't come through you till you let go of trying to flow it your way and just let God grow it his way. Now the last one. The Lord said, I'm awakening you to who you truly are and who I truly am within you. And I love being surprised by God. I love being shocked by God because it's so much fun because it, it shows me how far I've wandered but yet how close I am because he was with me the whole time I was wandering. And we only know we're wandering. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You're just on a bunny trail. Are you done with that now? Yeah, okay, let's get back on. You're never alone. Your eyes are on the external. He says, get your eyes on the internal and I will satisfy you. I will satisfy you when you feel dry. Take another look and I will satisfy. Your satisfaction comes from within and then he'll meet your needs outwardly. One day, the Lord said to me, Pat can never satisfy you or meet all your needs. He said, I alone water you. He's a companion. He's a nurturer, and you are one in the spirit and in the flesh, but don't depend on him to meet all your needs. He said, I, that role is reserved for me. If you put them in that role, it's idolatry. Anybody that you look to other than him and depend on, they can never meet all your needs. Sometimes, because I'm visu very visual, I get stimulated too much, and Pat don't, don't get it sometimes. And I'll shut the door and go in my room. And I said, Pat just doesn't understand, right? And the Lord says, but I do. Get over it. <laughs> I said, what? He said, you're thinking wrong. He said, trust me. So I come out of my attitude adjustment come back in the living room, and I shifted. Doesn't mean I'm always wrong. What it meant was I needed that nurturing from him to shift me where I got stuck in that moment. And actually, it expanded me. And I realized we complement one another. We minister to one another. We have fun together. And we're so much more alike than we were when we started. But he said, but you both have learned that I'm the river inside both of you. And because you walk with me in oneness, I flow through both of you. And you can walk together and not be shaken now. It's not enough to like physical, natural things together. You have to be a mutual flow together and let each other be each other. And let God be God through him, through me, through each one of you. 
that's when the greater river will bust out through all of you in this city. Because guess what? You're the fountain. He said, you want to see a greater breakthrough in this city? Break open. He said, break open. John 14, 8. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father. Jesus has been with them for three and a half years. Now we can use this to excuse, well, they didn't have the infilling of the Holy Spirit. No, but they had Christ. They had the living word, spoon feeding them, teaching them the revelatory word. They also had the companionship of Jesus, the fellowship that met their needs. Cause us to see the Father. That's all we ask. And Jesus. And he said, then we will be satisfied. Just let us see a sign, Jesus. And they've had three and a half years of signs. And Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father. Why aren't you able to connect it, Peter? Why aren't you able to understand? Jesus said, how long have I been with you all for so long, and you don't recognize me yet, or Philip? Open up. Let me make myself real to you. You have my knowledge here because I've taught you and trained you. And you can go out and fish for men. But he said, it's got to get in. It's not enough to give them the word that you memorize and analyze and, and learn and you've been trained in. He said, my breath and my spirit... How long? You don't know the fullness of it yet. You haven't let my spirit come through yet, right? Anyone who has seen me, now would naturalize your spirit man. He said, my sheep know my voice, and they will not follow another. How many, much of the church is getting led astray, following this one and that one? And this one and that one, and Jesus is saying, where are you going? What are you watching? What are you doing? Well, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm watching that. It's, it's, it's this person and that person. And he says, I didn't tell you. I'm not leading you. Listen to me. We're going to get distracted and led astray if we don't follow his spirit today. We must follow his spirit Verse 10, do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me? Here's the key. What I am telling you, I do not say on my own authority and of my own accord, but the Father who lives continually in me does the works. Father, thank you for bringing disobedience into obedience. In Jesus' name. Now, Jesus gave the key. Let's go back. We're not going to be distracted here. Verse 10. You must believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's with me, he said to them. We are one. I think this is the struggle much of the body of Christ has. We separate. They are one in you with you, for you, and through you. Jesus said, everything I'm teaching you, I'm not teaching you on my own authority, my own accord, but my Father, who is your Father, Sue, lives continually in me and lives in you. And he does the works. He said, you're following me because I'm doing miracles and works he said, guys, my father's doing them through me because I let him be seen. He said, it's my father that sent me. It's my father that's doing the miracles. His miracles, his deeds of power. It's my father demonstrating who he is through me, but yet you can't see him. And the church needs to understand it's the body of Christ that's going to do the miracles, the deeds, the power, releasing the Godhead in this hour, revealing who Jesus is, the Holy Spirit and the Father. 
that were so divided. They can't flow. They can't even grow inside of us because we control the growth. It has to meet our needs, our standards, our beliefs, our training. You're going to have to let go of training sometimes and just get untaught and untethered and just say, Lord, teach me. Give me your daily bread. Teach me what's important right now. I want to learn new. Sometimes we get too much learning. The Father who lives continually in me does his works, his miracles, his deeds of power. John and Jesus said, the kingdom of God has come into the world, is here, and has come with demonstration, not just observation, but he said, it's coming. And then Jesus went back, and he said, I'm going. And they all freaked out and cried, no, don't go. We're going to be alone. He said, you're never alone. I'm always with you. But my spirit is coming to abide in you and burn in you. Wait till he comes. How many waited? A small percentage. 25% waited for the promise. And it changed their life. It filled their spirit man with fire and desire. And their personalities changed and their lives changed and their understanding changed. And what filled them flowed out of them and multitudes came in. There's about to be a second wind. But it's not coming upon you. It's going to bust out of you. You are the fountain. You are the burning bush. You are the fire. You are the glory inside because you are the habitation. But stop trying to control him. I don't know anything, but I know him. I might have 30 years of understanding and encounters, but you know what? Every day is fresh and new because I want to grow more. And I don't care how he does it, what he says and what he wants, here I am. I've learned to surrender. I've learned to yield. I'm still learning to yield sometimes. But you know what? You're too hard on yourself. Don't overanalyze where you are now and yield to where he's going to take you. Because if you try to produce where you are now, where you're not meant to, it will quench your growth for later. Just flourish where you are. Blossom where you are. Bloom where you are. Love. Learn to love where you are. Let God steer your car. Let God have his way. Enjoy each other today. Love each other, because guess what? You're going to struggle on the way, because it's growing. But it's also flowing. And God wants you knowing how it's going to be going. Now this message, the Lord said, abundant fruit is about to break forth as shoots, because the stump that I pruned is about to, there's a new springing up of a new shoot. My church that I pruned is about to bloom. And she's not going to be like before. She's not going to be like any of the patterns that you've seen. I'm doing a new thing. It's fresh, fresh breath. Suddenly where we were dry and wounded on the battlefield, all it takes is a fresh breath. And suddenly, we're all standing up looking around like, you know what happens to animals in a desert when there's famine and it's dead and dry and they smell rain coming? They will stampede towards the smell that they're smelling. And you better not get in their way. There's about to be a stampede. Because the church 
that we once knew as dead. We've been dead in our educated head. But he said, you're about to break open in your spirit that's been educated by me, and you're going to release another reality. And you're going to be able to express who you are where you haven't been able to participate before. You're going to have fun. You are going to flourish. You're going to have fun being you. Because God's giving you a voice. He's giving you gifts. And you're not like your neighbor. It's okay. But you are needed. Every one of us have different gifts. And one gift isn't more important than the other. So get over yourself. And push others ahead of you. And let them open up. Because guess what? You need them. That's why we're doing these once, once a month School of Eagles and bringing other leaders in the body in this region in. Why? Because they have something that God's burning in their heart. Mark and, and um, Rob and Bob, he said, I have a fire burning in me. The Holy Spirit is burning in me. I can't, I can't eat or sleep or drink. And I said, you're the one. Come and tell. Come and share. You have something burning in you that God has put in you that the people need to hear. It's your time to step up. Get rid of the fear of man and trust the fear of God and let God out of you. There's a joy in it coming now. You don't need more training. <laughs> you need to let God out. You need to be comfortable being you in who he is in you. Be you. Sometimes I watch myself on the live stream when I hit a replay and I go, did I really say that? Did I really do that? And the Lord said, yeah, isn't it funny? Isn't that great? And I went, oh, and he goes, Sue, be you. I know who you are. Stop analyzing yourself. He said, actually, people that are like you, you minister to them just the way you are. God didn't call polished people. He called broken people in the Bible to be his vessel. So give yourself room and watch what he can do through you. And reach out to one another because you need every one of you. And the Lord is excited because he can do a lot through a people like that that would just let go and let him flow. What really rocked our worlds, and I'll say it again because I don't care how many times I have to repeat it. It's important because it really shifted my thinking. Prophet Ken Peters, years ago when we went back for Timothy's wedding, he sat Pat and I down and he says, the Lord gave me a word for you in SOG. I said, okay. I got all excited. <laughs> and he said, the Lord tells, says to tell you he loves you all very much. And I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> you know. And then he said, and the Lord says to tell you that he feels safe among your fellowship. And I was shocked. I said, really, God? He says, I can't trust myself among much of the body of Christ because they bite and devour and hurt each other. And what you do to your brother, you, you do to me. I can't trust myself to many. I can't. I know what's in them. I know what's in you. But if you will crucify that and let me change you, I feel safe. And I can come home. Yeah. And I can let my hair down among you. And I can be me. Yeah. And I said, Lord, have we ever done that to where you couldn't be you? He said, a few times. But you're learning to let go and let me be me. He said, my church needs to let me come forth and get out of my way. I want to be comfortable in my own house. Don't you want to be comfortable in your apartment, Sue? I said, yeah. He said, then invite me in and let me be comfortable in you. Make room for me. And that's what we try to develop. Lord, 
you feel safe. But Lord, come in and be comfortable now. Come in and stay. Come in and have your way. Come in and do whatever you want to do and be whoever you want to be. That is our desire and our purpose. Is to let him be the head. There's freedom in letting him be the head. And there's joy. And he said, Sue, when you do what? He said, you prosper. Now get this, as your soul prospers. When you let my head sit on your head, and you get out of the way, and you don't have to have your say in your way, all of a sudden, I meet all your needs. And all of a sudden, prosperity comes, and health comes, and joy comes, and peace comes, and your garden gets bigger and fruitfuller. And pretty soon your garden has a beach, and it has a field, and it has mountains, and it has valleys, and it has all kinds of things. He said, what could I do in your city? To the degree that you open up to me is the degree that I can move in your locality, because you're my body. In him we live and move and have our being. Oh my God, it's 9.30. Sorry, guys. I just looked at the clock. But you know, he's my life. I'm nothing without him. But with him, with him leading me, all I do is follow. You know, I, I get tired of leading, and he goes, good. And you know what? I love following. There's less work. And I'm not responsible for what happens ahead because I'm being led. Don't be, a freer, don't be afraid of the future. Let him lead you into the future. And if he's leading you, what? You'll be fine. Just breathe. Sometimes we just got to give ourselves a break. And just breathe. Let the breath of God start to blow in your garden. The garden of your thought life. The garden of your body. Your body needs refreshing, regenerating. The garden of your spirit. All three parts. Let breath begin to blow in your garden. Adam and Eve learned to recognize it. In the spirit, they heard God walking in their garden. When's the last time you heard God's footsteps in your thoughts, in your body, in your spirit? One time years ago, when I was going through severe uh, emotional and physical abuse and trauma, and I was at the end, and I, I was going over the edge emotionally and mentally. I literally was having a breakdown because I couldn't take it anymore. And Pat knows this. I was laying in bed, and all I could do was cry for days. I got to where I couldn't handle it anymore. And I cried for days. And I laid in bed, and, and Pat said, um, this was when he had met me, but um, I had only come once to minister at his church where I was going through a really bad marriage time. And I was in a fetal position for three days in my bed. I was so t tormented. I laid in bed. And I said, God, I can't take it anymore. I don't know what to do. I saw myself falling over the edge in my mind, literally. And I cried out. I said, Lord, help me. Because I was so broken by the abuse. As God is my witness, this is real. This has saved my life. A door opened in my bedroom. I heard a physical door open. Now, I'm falling over the edge. This loud, audible door opened. Footsteps on like a wooden floor. I have carpet in this old house I was living in. There's no wood floors. Loud footsteps, audible. I heard the door open, and I was afraid. I thought my husband was coming to abuse me again, and I froze. 
and I heard the footsteps, and I heard them, and I was faced the other way, and I heard them come around the bed. I had my eyes closed. I was so afraid to look. And he sat on the bed. The bed squashed down. And it brought me back off the edge. Because I heard the sound of him walking in my situation, in my garden that was destroyed and hurting and broken. And it brought me back. And he healed me just like that. And I never went through that again. I heard the sound of him walking. Audible. I know this is pretty graphic, but you know, sometimes you have to hear the sound. He has to be real. He was real before, but this was really real. And it pulled me out of something dark. Dark night of the soul. Years of abuse came to an end in that moment. The destructive force that was breaking me down into whole total brokenness. Even though I was a minister, I made wrong choices and I married a, a man I shouldn't have. And I was physically, emotionally, and spiritually abused. And my children were too. But I heard the sound. In that moment, I felt him sit on the bed. And when I got the courage to open my eyes and look, he wasn't there. But I knew he was there. And in that moment, I would be okay. Sometimes, even though we're all doing the ministry thing and we're doing the mom thing and grandma thing and we're doing everything we know to do, all we need to hear is a sound of him walking in our garden, in our life. And it will bring you back and it will anchor you. And it will set you free. Uh, I just want to add this because this part is amazing. And I've told Sue this, but when this happened to Sue, you know, she was there in Minnesota and I, and I was with a, we, I was in, a, at that time I was in uh, ministering in Buffalo, mm -hmm. New York. And uh, this one sister, and Sue knew that had met this sister. Her name was Jewel. She was a saint of God in Buffalo that I'd gotten to know. She'd been coming to the meetings in Rochester with some people that were coming a lot from Buffalo. And she came up to me, yeah. and she said to me, she said, Pat, I have to tell you what happened to me the other day. She said, and she came up, and she said, Pat, I, she said, I was, I got such a burden for 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 Sue and she said and the, and the Lord told me to pray mm -hmm. and she said I be so I began to pray for Sue and she said and I went into this experience this, like a vision and she said I saw Sue in her room there in Minnesota and I saw her in a fetal position in her in the bedroom yeah. and she was crying and she was so broken and she said, and, and, and she said, the Lord, and she said, I just, all I could do was pray and cry out to God and intercede. And then she said, and I saw the Lord come into her room and meet her in the vision. Yeah. And she told me, now, now this, and then a couple of days later, Sue calls me and tells her. Actually, you called me to check on me. And, and, and she tells me it, what happened to her, and it was exactly what Jewel had told me had happened when she prayed and got the burden to pray for Sue, and she saw it in a vision, and, 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 and she said the Lord showed, and she said, I saw the Lord come in her room and meet her. But I just wanted to share that because only God, see that's only, but, I, she, but this sister saw exactly what Sue had gone through, and the Lord had, had, had called on her to pray right when Sue needed it, and because of her prayer, God answered and did what she saw in the vision. Now, when Adam and Eve fell, disobeyed in the garden, and God knew what happened to them, they made a mistake. And they heard God coming, walking in the garden they were used to. And he said, where are you? But they hid. They were afraid. And he said, he knew what they did. He told them. But they had to come to terms with choices. 
And of course, that choice we're still dealing with today. But you know, it doesn't matter what you're going through, how tired you might be. Maybe you're not broken emotionally or physically or, or abused or whatever. Maybe you're just broke and you can't take it anymore. Maybe you're going through something else. But the God who lives in you walks with you. He walks up and down in you. But you need to walk up and down in him. You need to tap in and get in because it will save your spiritual life, your physical life. You know, you'll die early if you don't make changes because the stress and the pressure is going to kill you. The stress and the pressure, sickness and disease comes through stress. Not just sin. It comes through fear. It comes through many ways. And when I realize and say, Lord, I'm tired. Because leaders, actually, that pioneer plow a lot, we get tired. And a lot of people don't know that. Because we don't get a lot of help. But I have had to learn to draw from him for all my needs. Pat has. We almost didn't make it here as a church. We almost had to close. We had to fight because we weren't really to give up and nobody knew. Oh, many people talk, they think they know, but you know what, they don't know. But every time you get down to a stubble, and you get down to a stump and God prunes you down to nothing. It's because you're about to break into something new. He's killing the old in you. Because something brand new is about to bust out of you. And you're going to minister to so many people with more of what you've been looking for. But sometimes that seed has to go into the ground and die in order to be found again. And come around again. And we're in a new cycle. And what you've overcome, you now, have, you now have authority and power in that area. I usually don't share some of those things in my past, but you know, when you need him the most, you'll cry out. And when you cry out, he'll answer you. Just as I shared the last one, it's when I hurt my foot last year or a year and a half ago, year. I hurt my knee. I was in so much pain physically. I can take a lot of pain because I'm a tough old girl. But you know what? I was in so much pain in my bed, I was crying. I couldn't handle it. And again, I laid there and I said, Lord, I'm in so much pain, I, I can't handle it. And I was just laying on the bed communing. All of a sudden, I shared this before, I was floating above my bed. I had broke through a realm that I couldn't break through in any other way for some reason. But I broke through. I was floating above my bed. It took me a couple seconds to like, wait a minute. There's no pain. There's peace. There's release. I mean, it was um, the most shocking, amazing loving realm. I don't know how I got there, but I cried out till I broke through. And when I realized that I was back in my body and I had no more pain, and I healed very fast. We are coming to the end of ourself in the one way we know or we can relate to who our self is. And we're about to find another degree of who we are with him that we didn't know existed before. He said, when you get to the end of your faith, you'll find another faith. When you get to the end of yourself, you'll find another self. You're going to find another you, a fuller you, the one I've been developing in you, but now it's coming forth. Get comfortable with being you. Don't matter what people think about you, so what? It matters what God thinks about you because he's making you into who you are. Now, you're going to learn to work with others. You've got to learn to love and, and do things. But you've got to trust God with you so that you can be you and all that he's meant you to be. 
You're the garden that he walks in. Well, Lord, I'm in bed already and my feet, I don't want to get dirty and I don't want to have to get out of my pajamas and, and I'm tired. Come back tomorrow. He didn't come back. You missed the invitation. And then we were sorry we missed it. He don't care if your feet are dirty or clean or you got pajamas or you're naked. Well, you know what I mean. If he's knocking, just say yes, come in, Jesus. I want more. And he'll say, so do I. And I'll say, Lord, burn up this garden. And I literally posted that on my blog, and God torched it all those years ago. And he's been rebuilding my new garden. And my garden has cities and mountains and valleys and waterfalls and all kinds of beaches and all kinds of things. Why? Because I'm letting him be all who he is inside me and now through me in brand new ways. There's a discovery the church is going to make in the coming days that's going to set her free from the dominion of men and what they think she should be. It's time to be who God thinks you should be. And be free in being it. I'm the happiest I've ever been. Unless I'm going through something... <laughs> you know, daily duties, but I'm happy. I'm happy because I'm free. And God wants you to be happy and be free. Let the river out. Enter into that garden. Let him plant all of himself in you because whatever you receive from him in you is what will grow in your garden. He said, if you will do all these things, you'll never fall. Look in the epistles, and the Lord said, add to you these things. And if you will add all these things into your life, you will never fall. How about a church that never falls? I want to be that. And Jesus said, this is that. It was spoken by the prophets. Now is the time. Come in and feast and dine so I can feast and dine through you. And it's time to respond to his call. It's time to let go of you and trust him with you. And let him be through you who he needs to be. How many want that? Yeah. That's a natural part of our desire. Lord, I want more. I want to be like you more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Lord saw your hand. You're already on that journey, but he wants you to understand he's answering your prayers. He's working things out his way. Trust him along your way. Don't try to steer the future the way you want it to be. Let go of control. He knows the future, what's ahead. You don't. If you try to steer it the way you want it, you're going to mess your life up. You're going to mess your husband up, your wife up, your kids up. You know, parents, stop, stop trying to steer your kids. You can only give them your faith for so long. At some point, they have to find their own faith. Now, you can give them suggestions, and you can give them guidance, and you can correct them. But guess what? They still have to grow up. Trust God with your kids. Trust God with your husband your wife your church. Trust God. He knows what he's doing. If we will get out of the way, he can do a lot, even in one day. You know that? It's true. Sometimes we're the biggest hindrance to our kids being saved. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God's going to grow a new garden in you. And if you're really bold and courageous, like I was, Lord, burn my garden down. I want it bigger, better. He goes, oh, okay, and he burned it right in front of my eyes, and I went, oh, what did I just do? But look what I grew. 
Look how more lush he could be inside me because I was willing to let go of what I had grown. And now I'm, Lord, you grow what you want in me. And he said, I will give you more than you could ever ask for. It will overtake you. It will outrun you. It will mow you down, Sue. <laughs> Hallelujah. How many got something? How many, did, how many did God speak to you tonight? Hallelujah. Isn't that what it's about? How many feel so much better now than when you came in the door? See how good God is? So before we close, we'll just take an offering. You guys know the bucket. If God is really speaking to you, honor him. Sow a seed. It doesn't matter. Whatever you have, give to him. If he said don't give, then don't. If he says give, then give. You guys know how to give online? There's, diff there's PayPal and Cash App and Givelify and Venmo and Messenger and, you know, there's different ways. Don't be stingy with God. Give your life to him. Don't hold him at a distance. Surrender to him. He won't hurt you. He's actually going to bless you. Make room for him, and he will make his room in you. And you will hear his sound walking in you. And then you'll see yourself walking in him. Because you're one. And isn't that the purpose of habitation, that the church should be the place where Jesus feels safe and happy and just comes in, hi, guys, lets his hair down, and is able to be who we need him to be in that moment, filling us with life and love and liberty and freedom and wholeness. God wants a people he can dwell in freely, he doesn't need our permission, but he, but he wants it because he, we have a free will. He will only be able to do what you let him do. Isn't it surprising that in some places in the Bible, Jesus could do nothing because of unbelief? Because we were too stiff and rigid? I said, but Lord, come over here. You can do anything. I said, can I? He said, can I? I said, absolutely, come. How, what, what would our lives be if we said, Jesus, come and be free? Do anything you want. Here we are. That's exciting to me. He's the head, we're the body. And together we're one. So, Father, tonight, we all raised our hands because we understand there's more. <laughs> You're opening a huge door, and there's many keys in your hands, and you want us to understand. We're not limited to one anymore. You have multiple faces. You have many graces, many places, many keys, many doors, many floors, many realms to explore in you and also to release into the earth. Lord, we just say yes. We say yes to you, Father. You got something else? Come. Oh, go ahead. Father, we surrender. You're standing at the door, not just knocking. You're standing at the door walking, and we hear the sound of you walking right now in this season. And you're giving us new keys. Greater authority. Greater expansion in the earth and in heaven. And we want to be faithful stewards of your glory. And finish your generational story in the earth. Be glorified. We simply say yes. Here am I, send me. Here am I, 
live in me. Here am I. Have your say. Have your way. Do what you want today. Yippee yay, we're on our way. A camping, we're going to go every day. It's an adventure. Your life is not to be a drudgery. It's to be a fountain, a river, a stream. Don't divert your stream. Don't dam it up. Let the water flow. Let it go in the direction that he wants you to go. Trust the flow, even though you don't know which way to go. Trust him to lead and guide. Stay in his stride. Abide. Keep your peace. Enjoy his presence, and he will continually move you as you go. And you will feel satisfied. Hallelujah, Jesus. The Holy Spirit's already moving in the room. You don't need to come up and have me lay hands on you. He's touching you right now. He's been speaking to you all night. And those of you online, just say yes. Lord, let us hear the sound of your steps. And if we're falling apart, open that door and walk around that bed where we're stuck and save us from falling over the cliff. Help us get back on track. Set us free from abuse and torment and whatever else we've gone through in our life. In one second, you don't need 40 years of counseling. You need one second in his presence. Body, soul, spirit, snap, 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 you're back. Stop struggling with wholeness and just be healed. Stop struggling trying to get free and just be free. Say, Lord, you're the, you're the one that sets me free. Come in. Boom, here comes a fresh wind. And suddenly you get a whiff, and off you go. You're in a brand new flow. He waters you with his dew. But don't get used to just the dew. Wait till the rain comes. And then he waters you in the rain, and you get used to the rain. But then wait till the wind blows, and it becomes a storm. Wait till the lightning, the thunder, and his voice begins to speak. Let him come. Let him grow. Trust your flow. You don't need more training. You need to trust your flow. You need to trust his voice in you. You need to open up. Y'all are ready. God says, y'all, y'all are ready. <laughs> who's next? Who's going to speak next month? Which one of you? I've been trying to get you guys for a long time. You can't hide and you can't run. You know why? Because it's your time. Take a risk. And if God says step up, then let him speak or let him move or let him do. Wherever you go, do what he tells you. Don't be afraid. If people don't like it, too bad. Except for the leaders you're under. Show them respect. But I'm talking about people in your life. Don't be afraid of people. They are actually looking for God. They're looking for help. They're looking for love. They're looking for peace. They need a hug. They need love. They need a smile. They need a friend. They already know they're broken. You don't have to remind them. But be a friend and watch them mend. <laughs> Hallelujah. Y'all are ready. Let God out. Watch the garden become a river and the river become a flood and the flood become a hurricane. Hurricanes are coming in the natural this year. Watch. What you see in the natural will mirror the busting open of God in the spirit. Get ready for God's storms because your life is not going to be the norm. It's going to expand. How many are ready for some expansion in your life? Even if you're not ready, get ready because it's going to expand anyways. <laughs> get your foot off the brake, off the steering wheel. 
Let go and let him steer you the way he wants you to go. And you will be happy in the new flow because you've been trying to get there. Just let go and you'll get there. Actually, you'll find yourself there. When I learned to let go, I found myself in a higher realm. And I did not know how I got there. But it was what I was looking for the whole time. God's going to cause you to hear his footsteps walking in your garden. And you're going to join him. And miracles are going to begin to happen all through your life. And everything is going to straighten out. And you're going to thrive, not just survive. Because he will supply. i got to stop. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, thank you. The church has to get longevity. You know, he's not going to meet your time schedule. You want an hour? Drive up to the fast food and get it. You want two hours? It's my bedtime. i got to go. And God says, good night. But if you're hungry, you'll stay till you're fed and then go to bed. And you'll get better sleep instead because you made room for God. When I was younger, we had three, four, five hours church lessons. One time when we traveled with Timothy, this is no lie, he preached seven hours. I don't know how he did it. I mean, he preached seven hours, Vlad, and nobody left. It was the most powerful meeting. But you know what? We got in a realm where we weren't conscious of time anymore. We didn't care. It doesn't mean we have to be in seven hours. Wait till you're in for two weeks and didn't know you were in a meeting that long. And you didn't lose your job. You are fine because God took care of it. The angel worked your shift for you, and then you didn't even know you were gone. Your angel looks like you. They can take over. And then when you come back, they'll say, glad you're back. I hate your job. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm teasing. But if you put God first, everything you need he'll provide. And you can be in that meeting getting everything you need. And your angel will do what you got to do until you come back. I want more of that. Amen. How about if I sit on a city for a year? What can I do with you? How about if I sit on a nation for a, a year? What can I do with you? Ten years, two years, a month, a day. Will you let me have my way? Absolutely. Let's go, Jesus. Do what you want. Here we are. All right, y'all, go have a good night's sleep. We bless you. You've had enough. Watch the replay. Share the replay. You know people that are struggling. Send this video to them. We love you guys. Make mama proud. Have an adventure and break out. In Jesus' name.